Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 12, but really uh, verses 1 through like 7 or 8 are just, you know, to set up what we're going to talk about today. And that is the weak and beggarly elements. And in this case, he mentions the observing of times. Uh, so let's uh, read verse 1, Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, uh, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because your sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And we talked about that. Wherefore, thou art no more servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then? Now he's going to, he's setting all this up. He said, you're a son of God. Okay. And you were made a son of God by God's grace. Okay. So. You have the grace of God on you. You have God's mercy, which even the Old Testament says, his mercy endureth forever. So you were given this by the grace of God and not by the works of the law. How be it then? In other words, now he's going to kind of chew them out for something they're doing. He says, how be it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. You used to be pagans, used to do this, used to do that. Um, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, because we are elected, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? And he uses that word before. Here in verse 3, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. We were in bondage. Why again, to, why again turn to those same elements? Now, uh, I counted one time, and you have uh, elements here in verse 3, elements mentioned in um, verse 9, and then twice over in Second Peter, where God says the elements are going to burn up with a fervent heat. So four times the word elements is mentioned in the King James Bible, which is interesting because they're in classical ideology, we're t we were told that the earth was made up of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, we find out when we study these things out that these are simply um, ideas that represent the spiritual forces behind witchcraft. Because in witchcraft, every element, earth, air, fire, and water, has a watchtower, which is a spirit um, that is responsible for that particular element and that particular spirit happens to be a dragon so you have four beasts four dragons that are over each of the four elements when a witch draws her circle and gets inside of the circle to do her magic she calls upon the dragons of earth air fire and water to yield their strength to her so that she can have their power, so that she can uh, do, you know, she can cast a spell, a curse, or some kind of blessing, or she can say to the universe, hey, I want more macaroni and cheese, or whatever. And the universe gives her this macaroni and cheese, okay? Really, it's these devils that are doing this. That's what these elements then represent, because not only does she call upon earth, air, fire, and water, but she calls upon the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and four holy, quote-unquote, days, in which is sabbats, they call it, S-A-B-B-A-T. It sounds like Sabbath day, right? These are four holy days, uh, spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, winter solstice, and then you have what they call cross-quarter days, which is February 2nd, which is uh, Candlemas. And then you have Beltane in May. And then you have uh, something, I can't remember what it is. Uh, and you also have uh, Samhain, 
which is October 31st. And those divide the four main holidays. So you have these four, and then you have four more, okay? Which total is eight. Eight is the number for Antichrist. He is the eighth and is of the seven. So they're out worshiping the beast with all this witchcraft stuff. Now, there's a reason why I'm saying this, okay? Because look at what Paul says here in verse 9. But now, after that, you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? If we go back to verse 3, even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. We were ruled over by these elements, by these forces, by, by witchcraft. Witchcraft and every other religion in the world. Uh, even Islam, I, I realize this being out in Kenya with these mosques that are in these villages and they're all, they're not lined up with the street. If the street is not running north, south, east or west, they're lined up with north, south, east and west. They have to be this way because they believe that they must be facing a certain direction in order to talk to God. I can think of no place in the Bible that tells me that I have to be facing a certain direction in order to get God to hear me. The simplicity that is in Christ is we can be standing up, we can be sitting down, we can be laying down, we can be laying on our back, on our front, <clears throat> we can be, you know, swimming in the ocean, we're driving in a car or whatever, and we can call upon the name of the Lord and God will hear us. There is no requirement as to God saying, well, I want you to face this direction, or I, uh, if you pray on, on a certain day, then I'll give you more blessings on that day. I'll hear you better on that day, or uh, you can be saved more on that day, or whatever. And believe it or not, there are people who call themselves Christians who say that, who believe that. They have returned to the weak and beggarly elements, and they're in bondage again. They're in bondage to these devils. So he says... Uh, in verse 10, you observe days, months, times, years. You observe these days. You, you do time observing or the observing of times. Because, and there's four of them here. Because you think that in doing these, you have to do these according to the law. Or God's going to be angry at you, angrier than he was, say, when you were lusting after somebody. Or you were going, ooh, honey, look at our neighbor's house. It's better than ours. Okay? That's covetousness, which is idolatry, Paul said. And so, which, which, is, which makes God angrier? The fact that you didn't do the Passover or... The fact that you were doing something else, breaking the Ten Commandments, not doing what God told you to do, to doing what God told you not to do, which one piles on the anger of God? It's all sin, and all sin is covered and can be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace and not because we observed a day. Now, um, <clears throat> I have in my records, and I've used this, I've read it word for word, a Hebrew roots preacher by the name of Jim Staley from this general area, St. Peter's, Missouri, say he was teaching on the feast days and how all these pagan Christians who read the King James, uh, they're all pagans and they do the pagan Christmas and the pagan Easter and we don't do those things. And, and we don't observe those days. We observe Yahshua's feast days, like uh, the Passover Seder, which is a Jewish tradition loosely based upon the Passover that bears very little resemblance to the actual Passover. If you go through, and if you're able to find somewhere, what they do at a Passover Seder, and then read... What God told Moses to do, there's not a whole lot of diff there's uh, there's not a whole lot of coincidences there. They're not very close to being the same thing, because the Jews added a lot 
of the pagan traditions that they had picked up over the years, they added that into the Passover. Okay? And Christ knew it. That's why he told them, he said, you've taken your, and by your traditions, made the law of, of none effect to you. You've voided out the laws, what you've done. So anyway, this idea of observing times, Jim Staley actually said, I believe that when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, and uh, what he said after that was, I can't remember the exact words, but what he said was, when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, he blesses us more, or he is closer to us, or he hears our prayers, or we get this kind of blessing, or we get that, or whatever. More so than the pagan uh, uh, church-going uh, uh, people who go to church on Sunday instead of Saturday, the holy day. They go to church on that day, and of course we know that's evil, and they don't get the blessings that we get. That's what Paul was preaching against here. He said, you were saved. And, and let's go back to chapter 3. Uh, this only what I learned, verse 2, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. How did you get that Spirit? How did you get that Holy Ghost? Because you observed times? Or is it was just given you because you believed what God said about Jesus Christ suffering and dying, paying the penalty for us, so that no matter what, we are saved by God's grace and His mercy endureth forever. Okay? So Paul says, why would you go back then to that bondage of thinking you have to observe times, thinking you have to pray on certain days, thinking you have to do this and you have to do that. And if you don't do that, if you're not circumcised and keep the law, then obviously you're not a Christian like we are. And the large, huge majority of those who are of a Hebrew roots nature that's what they truly believe. At the, now, they talk out of both sides. They say, oh, we're saved by grace, keeping the law. That's what they do. They're double-minded, they're two-faced, and they're double-doctrined. They, they want you to believe we teach grace, we teach salvation by grace through faith. But in their teachings, they say, well, you're not keeping the law, so obviously you're not saved. Okay? Now, let's deal with this. On this issue of certain days, okay, I talked about it at uh, Christmas time. Those there are those who don't want to do, have anything to do with December twenty fifth, and I understand that. If you, if that's you, that's fine. I don't think you have to. I really don't. And uh, if that's your preference, then that's fine. Um, and I've run into some people and know some people that when it comes to those who do something on December twenty fifth. They don't come down in judgment on them. You know, well, you know that's, what, that's what they do, and I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. This is what I think God's telling me to do, so this is what I'm going to do. God bless you for that, okay? We're not all going to agree on every little thing. We're not going to see eye to eye on every issue. And there is an allowance for some differences in the body of Christ. Let's go to Romans 14 for that. Romans 14, verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. It's, it's like little kids telling, you know, brothers and sisters saying, Oh, you're doing that. You're going to get in trouble. But mom said I could do it. No, 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 no. Mom said I couldn't do it, so therefore you can't do it. And I'm going to go get you in trouble. You're in big trouble. Okay, and so anyway, one man esteemeth one day, this verse 5, above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Okay, even those who on the seventh day, they spend that time in prayer, Bible reading, Bible meditation, and so on. Maybe they fast. I, I get that. Okay. That's what they do. If you do that, that's fine. If you esteem that day, great. But to say that God only allows us to meet together as a church, as a congregation, only on the Sabbath day, Saturday, and forbids us 
from meeting together at any other time, any other day of the week, that's not in the Bible. It's not scriptural. And this is where I challenge, I challenge any Seventh day Hebrew roots, whoever you are, to show me in the law, the law, Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, take your pick, where God commands us to worship together as a congregation only on the Sabbath day and forbids us from coming together to worship any other day because that's the core of it. It's not that I changed the, how, well, how come you changed the Sabbath to Sunday? I didn't. Sunday's the first day of the week. It's not the seventh day of the week. The word Sabbath means seven. I know the difference. And on the seventh day of every week, I rest. I rest from my duties. My duties to my wife, my duties to my, my congregation. My wife goes shopping with her mom and I rest. Okay, I just sit in my chair. Maybe I get up and do something in the yard needs to be done or whatever. But by and large, I rest from my labors. Okay, God gave me that day to rest and I take it because I need it. It was made for me and for my benefit. And to say that I can only worship God in my church only on the Sabbath day, I would then be violating the very rule of the Sabbath day, which was to rest. So anyway, there's your challenge. Show me in the scripture. Show me the law where God forbids us. What if we wanted to have church? What if we wanted to start having church Tuesday at 1.37 p.m. in the afternoon? Can we do that? Yeah. It's liberty. Can we have it on Wednesday night? Yeah, we do. Then can we have it on the first day of the week? Absolutely. There is no condemnation against it anywhere in Scripture. None. So we get together on the first day of the week to commemorate the day of our Lord's resurrection, to commemorate the fact that this is the first day of the week and the first things always belong to God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I get the whole rest of the week because I gave God the first day of the week. Okay. So, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Verse 6 now, here it is. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. I know people that on Saturday, you know what you're going to find them doing? Reading the Bible, praying, studying, meditating on God's word. And they don't like anybody to disturb them. That's what they do. You know why they're doing it? They're doing it unto the Lord. So who am I to judge them? I'm not their master. I'm not the one that tells them, uh, you're not supposed to be doing that. That's not what God said. Let them, listen, they're reading the Bible. Let them read the Bible. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not... To the Lord he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Well, there's four things here. Um, the one who regards a day, the one who doesn't regard a day, the one who eats, and the one who doesn't eat. See, the gospel came to give us liberty. Even when it comes to eating unclean animals. When we pray... And offer God thanksgiving. Then what we eat is no longer unclean. It has been cleaned by the word of God and by prayer. So again, I don't believe in changing the law. God didn't change the law. I didn't change the law. It says, well, I like catfish. So I, I just think now we can eat catfish. Well, I'm not changing the law. I pray and ask God, catfish are bottom feeders. I get it. Okay? They eat all, anything that drops down to the bottom, they suck it right up, man. Okay? So they're not really the cleanest of all fish. They're awfully tasty, though. Receive it with thanksgiving and with prayer. I like clams, shrimp, lobster. 
crab. I like all that stuff. Okay, scallops. I love uh, squid. Okay, calamari. That's the better word for it. I like all that stuff. Okay, the Old Testament, you can't eat it. It's unclean. New Testament, prayer, thanksgiving, the word of God sanctifies it. What God has cleaned, call not thou unclean. Okay, so anyway, four things here because of the liberty of Christ given to us at the cross and Paul tells us, stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Oh, well, I, can't, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. No, no, I can't. Why? Because then God will be angry with me. Mm -mm. Ask God to clean it, purify it. After all, God cleaned you. Why can't he clean a piece of shrimp? A piece of bacon, ham sandwich. Why can't he not cleanse what it is that you eat? Are we saved then by what goes in our mouth? Are we saved or lose our salvation because we ate bacon instead of beef that day or chicken? Verse 7, for none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Now, I'm going to say this, okay? And this is, I'm not trying to dig. I'm not trying to get at anybody who has chosen to follow the dietary laws of the Old Testament as a matter of choice because you recognize that pigs don't have the cleanest diet in the world. And you would just really rather not eat pork because God said it was unclean and there's things about pigs that we just don't, we look at them and go, yep, that's not clean, okay? So you rather eat chicken or beef or anything like that, but not pork. And you say it's healthier for you, okay? God's diet is healthier than man's diet, okay? I can, I can handle that. I'm, I'm fine with that. But then there's people that, you know, if somebody is caught putting non-sugared sweetener into their coffee or tea, it's always somebody going to come unglued. What, are you poisoning yourself? You're poisoning yourself. What are you doing? Oh, my goodness. You don't eat that. That's poison. Don't you know what's in there? Okay. Or they drink soda pop. Or they eat potato chips or they had a candy bar, or, God forbid, they had some bread, and they weren't really aware that it was, that it was GMO, and people just come unglued on people over what they're eating. And they use the idea, well, God wants us healthy. God wants us to live a long life. And if we eat that stuff, we're going to shorten our life. Let's go back to what... Let's go back to what this says. Verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Now, God, in his wisdom, has already pre-selected the day of my death. God chose the day of my birth, did he not? God has already chosen the day and the method of my death. There have been people who have smoked cigarettes and lived to be a hundred years old. There have been people who have eaten lard all their life. And now, no, I mean, we, what are you doing? Are you eating lard? What are you, nuts? Man, I can just feel your arteries clogging. You can hear them clogging from here. What are you, crazy? See, we've been programmed and conditioned to say, that's evil, that's bad, you're going to die. 
There are people who live long, long lives, breaking all these so-called dietary rules that people lay down. And I just don't like bullies of any kind. Now, nice, respectable advice. People have given that to me over the years, and I appreciate it. Some of it I think is valid. I try to listen to it. But the bullies out there go around telling everybody, you shouldn't eat that. Well, what are you doing eating that? How come you putting that in you? What, do you just poison yourself? What, do you want to die? Don't you know God wants you? Don't you know that's a temple? You're defiling the temple. Don't you know God wants you to live? Excuse me. When God wants me to die, I'll die. And no amount of lard, bacon fat, Splenda, NutraSweet, saccharin, tobacco, sick, whatever. No amount of that hinders that or brings it about quicker. God wants me to live. I live. Listen. I've been electrocuted almost to the point of my death. And I had it reckoned in my mind that I was gone right then when it was happening. And God said no. So, which is worse for me? To have a cheeseburger every now and then, to put Splenda in my coffee, or to get electrocuted? Obviously now I stay away from electricity. Okay? But I've been electrocuted almost to death once and God didn't let me die then. And I'm not going to die until God says so. And you're not either. It's that simple. Again, now, if this is a choice you've made for yourself, a lifestyle choice, and it does work for you, makes you feel better, you, you do, your, your bones feel better, your heart feels better, you, you know, you take some woman took turmeric and got rid of her cancer. I'm all, I'm all for that. But that's not to say that everybody who takes turmeric is not going to get cancer or they're going to cure their cancer. Who knows that? Okay? We live and we die, and in all of that, we are the Lord's. He's the one who chooses that for us. So who am I to judge God's servant? I'm not your boss. You're not mine. So we can't be pointing out saying, well, if you eat this and you do this, then you're not going to live. Okay? It's not for us to say. That belongs to God. Now, I spent a lot of time on that, but let's start getting into, let, let's do one thing here. Uh, because I am going to deal with this issue of what God said about observing times. And I've got quite a few pages on it, so obviously I'm not going to get done today. But let's, let's go to Acts 15, and this number four keeps popping up everywhere I look in the Bible. There's this pattern of four, okay? And in this one in particular, because it's related to the gospel, or let's say it's related to the false gospel in the fourth kingdom. So, the idea of whether we should keep the law, keep the feast days, get circumcised, Go to Jerusalem and have uh, the Passover and have the uh, Feast of Pentecost and have the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Should we be doing these things? Should we be using Hebrew words? Should we be doing this and doing this? All this was talked about. It, the issue has already been settled. It's not that some people now have just now figured out after 2,000 years that everybody in the church has been doing it all wrong and even Jim Staley said that God downloaded to him these instructions on what he was to start teaching everybody. And it's the same nonsense that Joseph Smith got. Joseph Smith heard from the angel Moroni that all the churches are wrong. They got the gospel all wrong. They're missing a whole segment of the Bible, which I'm going to give you. And you're going to go straighten them all out. Okay? Joe Smith did this. Um, Charles Taze Russell, the same thing with Joe's Witness Cult. Uh, El, um, Ellen White 
with the Seventh-day Adventists. You know, all the church has been meeting on Sunday, and that's all wrong. God has shown that the angel has shown me that the Fourth Commandment's better than all the rest of them. We should be keeping the Fourth Commandment, and I'm going to straighten all the churches out. Okay? It's the same garbage. The Hebrew Roots people want you to believe that we should all go back to live like Jews, be like Jews, think Jew, uh, think Hebrew, talk in Hebrew, keep Hebrew feasts, keep the law, do all of these things, okay? And they say that, you know, churches all got it wrong. We're the ones who are going to restore the gospel, the real one, where you keep the law. But the issue has already been settled. The case has already been brought to court and the, the, the apostles of Jesus Christ have settled it. And it's in Acts 15. So let's pick it up. Uh, I'll let you read the first part of Acts 15. And if you think that I'm trying to leave something out of here, think again. Now here's what's interesting. Is that all the Hebrew roots cult people, you can tell they're Hebrew roots because every one of them has a Bible study on Galatians, a Bible study on Romans, and a Bible study on Acts 15. And what they're going to do is, they're going to set up what's called a straw man. He's not a real man. Okay? They're going to set up all kinds of nonsense and all kinds of unbiblical, extra-biblical information to make you think that Acts 15 is about something entirely different than what it's actually saying on the page. I say to you, Throw that stuff out. It's not God. It's not from the word of God. And trust only what this Bible says. God's not going to lie to you. So in Acts chapter 15 verse 13, let's pick it up and look at what the apostles and the elders said. By the way, there was no Pope here telling them all what to do. Okay. Acts 15, 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And now, let me stop right here because <clears throat> I'm going to throw something else in. Varying degrees of dispensationalists, not all of them, will say to you that Peter knew nothing of the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that it was Paul who had that mystery revealed to him, and only Paul. Peter didn't know it, because the gospel that Peter was to preach was to the Jews, and it was a different gospel. I'm not kidding you. That it was a gospel of works plus faith. Because that's how it was in the Old Testament, right? No, no. Nobody in the Old Testament ever got saved by the law. Nobody did. They got saved by believing what God said. Okay? As far as the, the death, burial, and resurrection, the Jews, they saw it every day in the sacrifices. They just didn't know what the lamb really was. Okay? They didn't see it for what it really was. But they believed it. Some of them did. So anyway, here, James is saying, uh, it was Simeon, Peter, who's telling us that God chose him to first go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel. If you go to Acts chapter 10, it was Peter, not Paul, who first went to the Gentiles. Okay? So if Peter was preaching a different gospel and only to the Jews, then why is Peter preaching the gospel that Paul preached, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, to Gentiles in Acts chapter 10? Before Paul ever really shows up, starts preaching. Peter did it, not Paul. Look at this. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles... Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Verse 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But we write unto them that they, and here it is, 
abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Four things. Let me run through this very quickly. The Catholic Church violates every one of these. They're abstained from the pollution of idols. Catholic Church is full of idols. They're abstained from things strangled or hanging from a tree. Cursed is anything hanging from a tree. And here it is. They offer you the body of Jesus Christ from a crucifix hanging on a tree. And from blood. And they hand you the cup and they say, this is the blood of Jesus Christ. This is real blood. Drink it. And from fornication. Well, that kind of speaks for itself when it comes to Catholic priests, right? Okay. And by the way, the pollution of idols. Think image of the beast. Things strangled. Think the five Philistine lords hung from a tree. Think of Absalom, who is the type of the Antichrist. He has the face of a man, hair of a woman, hanging from a tree. Okay? Um, this, I think, points to the Antichrist and the fourth kingdom. Stay away from that. Okay? That's the prophetic part of it. But anyway... Verse 21, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So we have one, two, three, four, Paul, Barnabas, Judas, Barsabbas, and Silas, four men. You're going to carry out these four instructions. I love it. Um, verse 23, And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. We never said that. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if we ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Now, not only is the meat of that letter very plain and clear, indicating that no such commandment is given to the Gentiles that they have to keep the law to be saved or to get saved or to stay saved. No such commandment whatsoever. It's settled already. Okay? The apostles agreed, the elders agreed, and the churches agreed. There was 100%. They were all as one in saying, this is the Holy Ghost. This is what God's telling us, okay? Which I'll say, I've never seen, I have never seen God move in such a way as that everybody was all on board to the same idea in a church business meeting. Okay, it just almost never happens. But here, this was important. And Paul knew this. Paul was at this meeting when he heard this. And he's basically saying this issue is settled, people. Yeah, we have these four things to observe. These are just things that God's telling us stay away from. And he's doing it for a reason. I think it's a prophetic reason. I, I don't know what it is yet. But I think we'll see it one day. In relation to the fourth kingdom. Incidentally. Starting in verse 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. Start with the word the right after that. Because that's what was the, in the letter. 
And I highlighted in the Pure Bible Search software everything from the apostles and elders all the way down to fare ye well. I highlighted those words. You can do the same. The computer counts 164 words exactly. And I knew that was a multiple of four. It's 41 times four exactly. Okay. This, this Bible, it's always in order in everything that it does and everything that it says. It is absolute and final authority declaring unto you and me that when God says it, he means it exactly the way he says it. And yes, it may be good for us. It is good for us to keep God's commandments. It is good. Paul even said it. He said, every time I do something stupid, I'm consenting that the law is good. Okay, and right and holy. So with as much as is in you, keep the commandments. With, and now, now it's different. I'm not keeping the commandments because I have to. My salvation's already been given to me. I keep the commandments because I want to. Therein lies the difference between what we believe and what the seventh day or all the cults or the Hebrew roots or whoever who tries to put burdens down, fundamentalists who try to put burdens down on people of things that they have to do to prove they're saved. Okay? It's all the same. Legalism is legalism. And when they go around telling everybody, you got to do this and you got to do that in order to show that you're really saved. We're not saved by that. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast because the people who try to enforce the rules on everybody are usually the ones who boast that they follow the rules without fail. And that's why God loves them so much. Mm -mm. God loves me so much already. I don't know why, but he does. And he loves you too. So he chose to forgive you with no promise whatsoever from you that you were going to live perfect from here on out. He loves you no matter what. Okay, that's the gospel. That's the real gospel. I hope that that's what you know and believe. All right? God bless you. It's good to be with you today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.